Hey, good morning. And those of you who are joining us by Facebook, we're glad to have you with us this morning as well. And stand, if you will, as we sing Our God. God this morning. He's awesome, isn't he? So glad to see you here at First Baptist Church today. You're always welcome here. Great to see some guests here today as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you for the privilege of worship. And Lord, we ask that you would help us remove all the distractions, all the interferences during this time that has been set aside to worship you corporately as the body of Christ. We pray that we would keep our eyes upon you and that you would transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit and that we would appreciate the freedom that we have even together in this place today for no other purpose but to celebrate who you are and what you're going to do in our lives. We pray for those that would be in the service today that would be lost and that need to come to that saving knowledge of who you are to trust in you as their personal Lord and Savior before it's eternally too late. We pray for the saints today, those that are truly washed in your blood, those that have been born again, that we would be sanctified. And we would become more like you each day. We thank you for the praises that we can sing. We thank you for the power of your holy word. We thank you for families that are represented all across this building today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated here. Well, you have your bulletin. 
And uh, in your bulletin, you will know that tonight our evening service is at 6 o'clock. I always invite you to come back for that service. It's a wonderful time where we can continue to worship the Lord and thank Him for what He's doing in our lives. And then this week, we have the Louisiana Baptist Convention that's going on, and many of us will be there representing First Baptist Church, so be praying for those services and praying for that time of business. I know Brother Bubba Mills is looking forward to it. He's got it marked on his calendar, and he's ready to go. And then Wednesday night, uh, we will have our, our time where we're studying through the book of Ephesians, and so I would encourage you to invite people here for that time of studying, also time of prayer. Then you need to be reminded of this, I know. I was talking to a pastor friend the other night about this, and his church is planning on being there, and we have several churches in our area that will be next Sunday night across the street over here at the Methodist Church where we have our community Thanksgiving service. And be praying for me as I will be bringing the message that night that the Lord would give me a message for our community and for the people of God. If you would agree to do that, would you just say amen? Amen. All right. Now let's uh, welcome everyone and say you're glad to see them here at First Baptist Church this morning. As you're returning to your seats, join us as we sing There's Power in the Blood. Oh 
sing our offertory song this morning, This I Believe.
for I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. And Father, we um, come this morning and Lord, we do confess you today, Lord. And we believe in you. And Lord, I we just pray that you would be glorified in this service this morning. And we want to worship you, I'm not just with our lips, but with our um, hearts. And Lord, I pray that you help us to worship you in spirit and truth today. Lord, take the money that we're about to um, receive and Lord, use it for your glory and to build your kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
the goodness of God. So my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Take your Bibles and find 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. But the people answered Him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take this message today and seal it into our hearts and minds forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Competition is a good thing. It allows us to compete, and it usually, notice I said usually, brings out the best in people. Can I get an amen there? It usually brings out the best in people, but sometimes it can honestly bring out the worst in people. Uh, Today, we need to know more than ever before that as Christians, we are not in competition with each other. We are on God's team serving the Lord Jesus Christ and we are not competing against each other. Yet we are to be faithful servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Team competition, I believe, can be a healthy thing. And this morning, I'm going to be talking about a competition of a different sort. The competition between good and evil. A competition between God's man and and the people of Baal. We're going to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. And I want you to see how this showdown unfolds. First of all, Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, gives an impassioned challenge. Now my experience with people is that they need to be challenged. Me personally, I know that I need to be challenged in my life to be everything that Jesus would have me to be. And when Elijah gives this challenge, I want you to notice that King Ahab obeys Elijah's marching orders. King Elijah, as I would like to say, in this moment is the one that is telling Ahab what to do. But Ahab is supposed to be the king, but because God has his man... Ahab is the servant and he's doing exactly what Elijah tells him to do. I'm here to tell you that when we honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He's the one that gives us our marching orders. He tells us what we are supposed to be doing in our lives. Elijah is serving the God of the universe. And he knows that ultimately he is accountable and responsible to the God of the universe. And he asked the people a question. A question that we need to ask ourselves this morning, First Baptist Church. How long will we falter between two opinions? 
Either we follow God or we follow Baal. Either we live a life of idolatry or we live one that honors God. I believe this question is just as real today as it was when Elijah was saying it to the people back then. We have to decide who we are going to serve while we're here on this earth. And we as believers, as Christians, know that our responsibility is to follow the Lord and to serve Him all the days of our life. We are not supposed to live a, do a life that is consumed with idolatry, paganism, materialism, all these things that distracts us from the real issue at hand. The truth is, we made the decision this morning whether to serve God or to serve Baal. To serve God and to follow Him and to make sure that He's recognized in our life by being the true and only God. And so you have to decide. It is decision time for all of us. And here, we need to understand that everyone has a right to their opinion. But as one preacher said it, you don't get to make up the facts. The fact is that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The fact is that God is Jehovah God. He is Yahweh God. He will rule the universe. He alone is God. There are no other gods besides Him. And so it's decision time. Uh, those of you that have been here for our study on Elijah, you realize that there was someone by the name of Obadiah that was in the king's court uh, that tried to have it both ways. Uh, he lived and did what Ahab wanted him to do, but when he encountered the prophet of God, the man of God, he fell on his face and he said, Elijah, what am I going to do? Elijah said, you do what I tell you to do and you'll be all right. And so he went to the king and said, Hey, Elijah wants to have a meeting. He wants to have a showdown. Oh, and I'm reminded of, of showdowns. It's, it's a time where it usually gets our attention. Someone is going to win the showdown and someone's going to lose the showdown. That's what it's all about. It's a time of decision. And Jesus said it this way, no man can serve two masters. You have to serve Him or serve the world. You cannot serve two masters. Either you will be loyal to Jesus or you will be loyal to the things in this world. You can't have it both ways. Jesus said you must serve one. You can't serve both. What they were doing here is they were mingling the worship of Baal with the worship of God. And so many times, if we're not careful, we will, we will mingle the worship of Baal with the worship of God. Uh, we'll say things to God, well, God, if you fit into my schedule, my busy schedule, then I'll worship you. But only if you fit into my schedule, I don't have to fit into your schedule. God, I'm only going to honor you when it is most beneficial for me. And yet we are dealing with a society today. We are dealing with churches today that try to have it both ways. We are dealing with people that are claiming to be Christians, yet they are making decisions that doesn't prove that they are Christians based upon their actions. It's decision time at First Baptist Church. It's decision time in our community. It's decision time as a state and as a nation whether we're going to serve God or serve the things of this world. You see, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, I want you to turn there. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 about the Laodiceans, the lukewarm church. He says this, I know your works, verse 15, 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What Jesus is saying there about the Laodiceans, they're so lukewarm, they make him sick in his stomach. And I would say today that there are people that say that they know Jesus Christ, but they make Jesus sick at his stomach by how they live their life. They're hot, they're cold. They're on fire for Jesus, and then one day you can't see them anywhere worshiping Jesus. They try to have it both ways. My friends, as we heard in the, in the special this morning, God is always faithful. He will never leave us or forsake us. And we have a sacred duty as His children to honor and obey Him. Here as Elijah calls the people together and says, how long will you falter between two opinions? The silence here is deafening. When the man of God presents a challenge to people, listen to what people say. The silence is revealing that they don't want to take action in this moment. They want to have it both ways. And because that had become a part of their society and the things that they were doing, they wanted to be able to serve Baal and do what Baal desired for them to do instead of serve God. You see the absurdity of this position? You either serve God or you serve Baal. Now, now who in their right mind would say, I'm going to serve Baal and say that they're going to serve God? You see, when, when you look at the situation and the set of circumstances, it's absurd to think that someone would choose not to serve Jesus and to serve the things of this world. To not to worship Jesus and to, to fall down in humble adoration and yet do the things of the world. It's absurd. And yet people all around us are choosing to do that. Dear friend, you may do that when you leave this place. You may be involved in some type of, of sin that only God knows about, but He knows it. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And yet you come and worship God in this moment, and then you go out and serve Baal and the gods of this world. And you see nothing wrong with it. You say, God understands. He, he accepts me for who I am. My friend, Jesus saved you to change you. To give you a new life with Him. Elijah declares in this moment in verse 22, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. I want you to imagine this. Elijah is only one man. Baal has 450. And if you're looking for the showdown, you say, Oh, Elijah, you're in for it, son. You are outnumbered. Most of the people are against you. Elijah, you are up against it and there is no way you're going to win this showdown. No way you're going to come out on top. We've discussed it among the prophets of Baal and everything is going to go our way. Just watch, Elijah. You'll see. F.B. Meyer said, Everywhere men are trying to win the smile of the world and the well done of Christ. You know when you're in competition, you want to make sure that your teammates are truly your teammates. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're, you're competing for a prize that your teammates are not working against you, but with you. And how do you know that? Well, you only know by the way that they perform out on the field, out on the court, or on a baseball diamond, or, or whatever they're doing. You only know if they're working with you or against you by what they do. Elijah is saying here, you can't be someone who says that you're neutral. Uh, you ever met people, there's, there's a situation going on, and they said, I'm just not going to get involved in that. I'm just going to be neutral. Listen to me. You're either for God, or you're against God. 
You're either with Him or you're against Him. You say, well, preacher, there's a lot of gray areas in life, and hey, I'm just going to stay in the gray area. Listen to me. When it comes to serving God, there is no gray areas. You're either all with Him or you're against Him. You're either with God or you're against Him. He said, if you're for me, then be for me. Make it a point in your life to know that when God tells you to do something, He is looking for obedience in your life. Secondly, let's see this. Elijah gives some specific instructions here. The Bible says in verse 23, Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. But put no fire under it. That's key, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you shall call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, He is God. So that all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. They speak now, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Elijah says, lay it on the altar. And then, the God who is God will answer by fire. I, I like this, when he says he will answer by fire... Uh, this is a competition, this is a showdown in which God is going to reveal Himself. Uh, and as we think about it in this moment, Elijah is being pushed to the front. Remember, he shows up out of nowhere and appears before King Ahab, the preacher without a resume. And then God sends him away to, to receive nourishment from the from the the birds, and, and to be able to drink from the brook. And now the whole time God is training him, getting him prepared, getting him ready. And then now he appears before King Ahab, and God pushes him to the front. Can I be honest with you? In my life, if it were up to me, I would be in the very back. But throughout the course of my lifetime, God has always nudged me to the front. Whether it's on boards or, or whatever it may be, I try to stay back and be low-key and, and stay just focused on what's being said. But, but God has a way of pushing us out front. And He pushes Elijah out front. He's not going to let him... Uh, stay in a remoteness. He, he pushes him to where he wants to be. And let me tell you what happens. If God is the one pushing you to the front of the battle, He's not going to leave you. If He puts you on the front line, and He's the one that's doing it, He will not leave you. Now listen to me. It may cost you your life. But God, even in our death, is glorified. But as you look at the Bible and you see the ones that are pushed out front, God has a way of protecting them and providing for them and saying, Hey, you just trust me. I got this all taken care of. Are you facing some circumstances in your life that it's beyond your control, but you know God has got it. He's got it all under control. Whether it's a sickness that you're dealing with or, or maybe it's a trial that you're going through in life. God has got this. And so Elijah, as he was going through this experience and as he was preparing for it, he gives these specific instructions. Bell's prophets, how many of them were there? 450. And they were false prophets. Let me say that again. They were false prophets. And so listen to this. When God gives specific instructions in life, follow it to the T. Now, yesterday I went to vote. And the lady said, Nathan, 
uh, sign your signature right there. So I wrote my signature in cursive. I said cursive. Johnny Nathan Davis. And, and then I saw a spot there that said initials. And so I said, oh, I got this. I can write my initials, J-N-D. And I was in the, in the voting place there, and all of a sudden I heard someone say, hey, he signed his initials. I thought, oh, no, she's talking about me. And I came out and she said, you were only supposed to sign your signature, not give your initials. That's where I put my initials. You see what the point is? When God gives us specific instruction, don't be like the preacher. And go beyond the instructions. Just do what you are told to do and everything will be all right. Well, it was a simple solution. She just put her initials next to mine. No big deal. And when God signs something for us, rest assured that it has His authority with His backing. The third thing we see here, the prophet of God, the preacher of God, uses some sarcasm here when it comes to the prophets of Baal. Verse 27, And so it was, or let me read verse 26 here. Verse 26, So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us! But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy. Or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they crowd aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And it was midday. When midday was past. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Now, I want you to imagine this. These prophets of Baal, they're, they're, they're dancing, they're cutting themselves, they're, they're trying to get Baal to answer with fire and to consume this sacrifice with fire. Oh, and the prophet of God is watching and he is laughing and he is mocking them and says, Go on! Keep doing it! Shout some more! Sing some more! In fact, it is known by many Bible scholars that Elijah is making fun of them so much, he says, Maybe Baal has gone to the restroom and he can't hear you. Maybe he's doing all these things and hey, you're trying to get his attention, yet he is not responding. When people are involved in idolatry and, and worship of idols and they're doing all these things, when, when it comes time for a crisis, when it comes time for a moment, cry out to that false god and see if that false god hears you. He will not do it. He will not answer. And so Elijah here in this moment says, keep doing it. And you say, well, hey, that's not good. Yes, it is. Sarcasm has a way of proving a point, even if it's a point that should not be considered. What happens when we're consumed with the things of this world? What happens when we're in moments where we're, we're in uncertainty and, hey, we're experiencing these things? We see Elijah's great campaign. He, he gathers these 12 stones and and uh, he makes one as a sign of, of unity, and it's at the evening sacrifices. And I want you to know this. When it comes to Elijah, he was a servant of God, nothing less, nothing more. He was simply stating what God told him to state in that moment. And a servant in that moment, that's exactly what they do. God instructs Elijah, and he obeys. And with this great campaign, we see that revival breaks out among the people. 
The Bible says here in verse 30, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar that was broken down. And Elijah took the twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Revival only comes when there's unity among the people of God. Do you see that there? He gets the people together. Uh, There's unity in this moment. And I want you to think about this. Revival does not come when you have divisive people. There are some people that have a divisive spirit. They're always trying to sow discord among the people of God. The Bible says to reject such a man. After the first and second admonition, you reject them. That divisive spirit is not going to go away. They will always be a troublemaker. They will always be trying to cause the people of God to be in turmoil. There are those that are divisive and those that are critical. This morning you may have come to worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and yet you're critical about things. Uh, You come to First Baptist Church and you find something to criticize. Let me tell you this. If you look hard enough, you will be able to find someone or something to criticize. There's nothing perfect about this church. There is something perfect about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who we serve, the one who we acknowledge as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And here it takes God displaying His power for them to believe. The Bible says here in verse 39... Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, This is the Lord. He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now how did it all end up here? As Elijah got this altar together, he had them come and and pour water on it. Buckets and buckets of water. And why did he have buckets of water? Buckets of water that he poured out over and over. Some people say, well, how could he do that? There was a drought. Well, if you know the location of Mount Carmel, you know that the Mediterranean Sea was there. Salt water. And so in all likelihood, they're bringing this salt water and, and they're pouring it out on the altar. And Elijah's saying, hey, it's not going to be internal combustion that's going to start this fire. It, it's going to eliminate all skepticism of how this is going to happen. And as it is being displayed, as it is being poured out upon this altar here, this water... God is getting ready to display His power. And as He displays His power here, they eventually believe because God does a miracle. Now let me ask you this, what kind of faith do you have? Do you have to see a miracle in order to believe God is in control and He's in charge? Uh, Do you have to see something miraculous take place and, and you go to a place and you say, oh, nothing's happening, nothing's really going on. Hey, when you think God isn't working, that's when He may be working the most. Just because you don't see the results and things that you want to see doesn't mean that God's not working. God is oftentimes working in the midst of what we think is silence. When we think that God is not doing anything, God is doing His best work. And then He's getting ready to display Himself. You remember when Jesus appeared to Thomas and Thomas said, unless I see the nail scars in his hand, unless I see his feet, I will not believe. And who shows up to Thomas? Jesus does. And he says to Thomas, because you had to see me to believe that I was resurrected, those that do not see me, yet they believe their reward is greater in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to have that kind of faith where I don't have to see certain things to believe that God is in control and God is working. I'm not those those people that say, hey, show me and I'll believe it. I believe the Word of God. I believe that if God wants to do something, He is more than capable of doing it. And so Elijah instructs them to gather all the false prophets and then listen to what happens to them. 
Verse 40. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kidron and executed them there. Wow. What happened? 450 prophets of Baal against one. And who won the showdown? God Himself did. And and you look at this moment and you say, man, that is heartless, that is extreme to kill the prophets of Baal one by one with a sword. Let me tell you this. When there is sin in the camp, when there is disease in the body, you want to make sure that it's all removed so it doesn't come back and cause harm to your body. You want to make sure that it doesn't cause people to worship Baal instead of worship God. That's why he executed every single one of them. God's campaign is a great campaign because it's one for His truth. Have you ever thought about as as God is revealing His plan to Elijah here? He's he's revealing it like a piece of the puzzle, one piece at a time. Immediately when He called Elijah, He didn't say, Elijah, go kill all the prophets of Baal. Go, Go deal with Ahab immediately in that moment. No, one piece of the puzzle at a time. One step at a time. One day at a time. Three and a half years later, we have arrived at this point where the prophets of Baal are dead because God is alive. Let me tell you this, when God puts the pieces of the puzzle together, He doesn't leave out a piece. You ever put a piece of the puzzle together piece by piece and you get to the very end of it and it's missing a piece and you say, what in the world has happened? You call the company and say, hey, you left out a piece. God doesn't leave out any pieces. He puts it all together. His Word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And we must know God's plan. Do you know God's plan this morning? You say, I hope I do. God reveals His plan through His Word. He reveals His plan through, through our praying. And let me tell you, most of the time when God reveals His plan, it may not make sense to you. It may not make sense to others. But listen, it doesn't have to make sense. We just do what God says for us to do. We be obedient like Elijah was obedient. And God will take care of everything else. We must allow Him to work His plan. Obedience is the key. And let me tell you this, when when God has a plan and when He has a purpose for your life, you will feel invincible in that moment. You know why you will feel invincible? Because God told you He was going to do it and He'll do it. And even though the world may seem like it is against you, if God is for you, who can be against you? You will feel invincible in that moment. You will feel like that you can walk through bricks. You will feel like no matter what happens in life, God is going to protect you and guide you just like He did for Elijah. If it's His plan, His plan, He is working it. He is fulfilling it. Men in circumstances and opposition are no match for God. No match for God. You can take the entire population of the human race, 8 billion people, and they can say, hey, we're going to be opposed to God, and yet they're no match for our God. Because He is Almighty. What we see here is an erosion of spirituality. Uh, You look at the nation of Israel and you see at times where, hey, it seems like they got it together, but then at other times they they don't. How how do they end up at this point? 
Let me tell you what happens. Liberalism creeps in slowly but surely. Most people don't drift towards the Bible and conservatism. They drift into liberalism and idolatry. And they drift and they drift and they say, how in the world did we end up here? When you have professors of seminary saying that the Bible is a myth. No, it is not a myth. It is the Word of God. And Southern Baptists took their stand and said, no, we will not allow that to be taught to our preachers. Because that is not what the Word of God says. And so we today make it a point to know that God supplies all the things that we need. He provided water and bread and supplies for Elijah. And maybe you need to ask yourself this question today. What would He have you to do? What will He have you to do in your life? Let me tell you what's going to happen. If you serve God, there's going to be scrutiny. There's going to be opposition. There will be people that will be opposed when you stand for Jesus Christ. There will be those that will look at circumstances, even as Elijah was putting the altar together, as he was having all this water, he gathered them in closely and said, Hey, look! No tricks here. No hidden hand. This is what God is getting ready to do. I want you to see it. So that when you leave, you don't say, well, I think he had a little match he threw underneath there. I think he was kind of doing things behind the scenes to manipulate the situation to get it to where it needed to be. Oh, you would never be like that. You would say, oh, God is awesome. He's wonderful. He did it. Fire came down from heaven. Our God is greater. Our God is awesome. Our God is the one that we serve. And no circumstance happens beyond His permission. This morning we see a test of rival systems. One with Baal, one of idolatry versus the true and living God, Yahweh God. And as we think about this today, what happened to Ahab in this moment? Ahab, I think, was confident that all of these prophets of Baal would come out on top. Oh, he was, he was certain that one man who says he believes in God was surely going to be defeated by all of these prophets of Baal. But you know what happened? Oh, this is good. All Ahab could do was stand back helpless. He was helpless. Because he saw his idolatry was confronted by the true and living God. What happened to the prophets of Asherah? There was a lot of them. Sexual immorality, lust, pleasure. They didn't even show up for the fight. They were eating at Jezebel's table. Let me tell you this. When you show up for a fight, and you know that God has your back, there will be some people that will not even show up. Because of the pleasures and concerns of this world, they are not going to come to a fight between good and evil. Those prophets of Asherah didn't come. But what happened to the prophets of apostasy? What happened to them? They all died. And you know what happened after they died? they had to give an account of their life to God. He judged them in that moment. And so today, let me ask you, 
Does God need to reignite a fire in your life? Do you need to be reignited for Jesus Christ and for Him alone? Do you need personal revival in your life? We're getting ready to go to the Louisiana Baptist Convention. And leading up to the convention, our executive director had the executive board read a book or a booklet called Change Me. That deals with personal revival on an individual level. And let me tell you this. If you'll draw a circle around your body, that's where revival begins. It begins with you. It begins with me. Maybe you need God to reignite that fire in your life. Maybe for some of you here today, you know nothing about the fire. But let me tell you, Jesus Christ can save your soul. He can give you everlasting life. But you trust in Him. You surrender all of your life to Him. And He'll save you. He'll give you everlasting life. And let me tell you what will happen with your life. If you'll surrender your life to Jesus, He'll use you. There may be times in your life where it seems like the, the world is opposed to you when, when there is great opposition, but if God is working in your life, just as He was working in the life of Elijah, He can work in your life. And don't be influenced by the culture, the society, where people say this is acceptable behavior. Nothing wrong with it. Everybody's doing it. No, dear friend, when Jesus saves us, He sets us apart. And we serve Him all the days of our lives as His servant. His servant. Until we take our last breath. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, This morning, are you trying to have it both ways? Are you trying to straddle the fence? You need to decide this day whom you will serve. And as Joshua said, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is that you today? Can you say, I will serve the Lord and my whole family will serve the Lord? I hope you can. I pray that you can say that today. But if you don't know Jesus, trust Him as your personal Lord and Savior. You can say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Save me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus, from this day forward. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you've done in this service today. We thank you for your truth that remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will never change. It will never change, Lord. We know that. And so help us decide today to follow you and to serve you all the days of our lives for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. As you stand, Melanie's going to be playing. And listen to me, church. Listen to what your pastor says here. Decide today that from this day forward you will always serve Jesus Christ. 
no matter what it may cost you, will you serve Jesus? If she plays, you come. Come. As others continue to pray, will you come and pray? Because your indecision is really a decision. Will you come and do business with the Lord? Melanie continues to play. Do you recall the story? It said they all fell on their face before God because they recognized that He is the true and living God. When's the last time you fell on your face before God and humbled yourself in His sight and said, God, I love you. I need you. Work in my life. She's going to play just for a moment here. You come and do business with the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you so much for your kind attention today. Let me say this to you. The day is drawing near. I hope you're ready. Don't forget tonight our evening service, 6 o'clock here at First Baptist Church. I encourage you to come and be a part of that service. I believe you'll be blessed. Our midweek service, don't forget about that. And then invite someone to be here tonight and this Wednesday night and next Lord Day if Jesus Christ tarries. Any other announcements we have today? Any other announcements? All right, Miss Marianne. Yes, ma'am. Thanksgiving supper this Wednesday night. Dressing in all the trimmings. That's great. I invite you to come for a time of fellowship. And then as we have fellowship, we'll come and study the Word of God. And so we'll get physical food and also spiritual food to help us throughout our lives. Anything else? Yes, we're going to start our um, secret swap. If anybody is interested in doing that, we've done that the last um, many years. <laughs> and it's for ladies. Guys, if you want to participate, that's fine too. But um, it's our ladies ministry. And if you need more information about it there's some papers over here you can sign up it's just kind of like a secret sister thing for those of you who have never done it before and it's a lot of fun so i encourage you to participate all right all kinds of things going on here at first baptist anything else well do this for me okay smile say it's good to be in the house of the lord 
And as I leave here today, pray that the Lord would seal this message to our hearts and minds. Amen? Paul Mosley, would you dismiss us today, sir?